The reading comes from Matthew 9, verses 14 and 15. Then the disciples of John came to Jesus, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, The attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Please be seated. One of the most influential preachers in the first thousand years or so of Christendom is a man by the name of John Chrysostom. Chrysostom served as bishop of Constantinople during the fourth century and was renowned not only for his powerful sermons, but also his paltry lifestyle, we might say. In an age known for its opulence, Chrysostom's humble austerity was considered garish by the societal elites, including many of his fellow, fellow clergymen. Indeed, his abstemiousness even caught the attention of the emperor, Cadius, and it offended him so much that he eventually banished the bishop for his asceticism, an action which would lead to the churchman's death by exposure. It's a grisly tale. But it also, uh, besides from teaching many things, it serves, uh, serves as a grim reminder to us at the present moment that there's nothing more despised in times of decadence than self-discipline. Now, I begin our discussion on fasting with Chrysostom because he has bequeathed to the church what may be the most sweeping endorsement of the practice from the pre-modern era. And having him, him established himself, as I mentioned, in the most thoroughgoing way as a true disciple of this particular discipline and of many others, it seems prudent for us to consider, at least for a moment, his reasoning, why he valued fasting so much. Of the spiritual exercise, he had this to say, fasting is, as much as lies in us, an imitation of the angels. It is a school of prayer a nourishment of the soul, a bridle of the mouth, an abatement of concupiscence. It mollifies rage, it appeases anger, it calms the tempest of, the nature, of nature, it excites reason, it clears the mind, it disburdens the flesh, it chases away night pollutions, it frees from headache. By fasting, a man gets composed behavior, free utterance of his tongue, and right apprehensions of his mind. The benefits of fasting, says Chrysostom, affect one's entire being, the intellect, the affections, and the will. For the ritual, as he said, clears the mind. It calms the tempests of nature and disburdens the flesh. If you have trouble with clarity of mind, the last thing you might think is, well, I need, what I need to do is fast. But that's what he recommends, although the first time you fast, if you've never fasted before, you will not have clarity of mind, right? It will be a time of suffering, but if you fast regularly, it has this great power to clear out all the nonsense from your mind and really bring clarity of focus. But it is a practice, according to Chrysostom, according to this bishop, that's so broadly effectual that it warrants as evocative and disparate descriptors as a bridled disburdening a calming excitement, a composed freedom, a glowing endorsement which noticeably contrasts with the much dimmer view one often finds in modern evangelicalism. Now likely none of us needs a targeted research study, although they exist, to alert us to the fact that American Christians prefer feasting over fasting. Or maybe it's more precise to say feasting instead of fasting. Because in the biblical view, it's not an either-or proposition where we have to choose between feasting and fasting, but rather it's a both-and, with fasting being the necessary preparation of the mind and body for feasting. Indeed, the biblical pattern is to fast in order to feast, as this lesson will attempt to show. The problem for many of us, for many American Christians, is that we've jumped right to the feasting. A sin of impatience is ours, and it's one that we have unfortunately inherited from our primordial parents. Basil of Caesarea is another fourth century bishop, 
we're living in the fourth century in this sermon, I guess. Uh, but he makes much of the fact that the first prohibition, which Adam receives in the creation narrative, is an embargo on eating, where he is not permitted to partake of the fruit of the tree which lies in the middle of the garden. And this, according to uh, the good bishop, establishes what he calls a law or a principle of fasting. And I think he's right about that, but it must also be pointed out that this divine injunction that's given to Adam comes after this divine invitation in Genesis 1.29. So he's told not to eat of this one particular tree, but that's only after he's given this invitation where God says to him, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed. It shall be food for you. Or again in Genesis 2 verse 16, God says, For any tree of the garden you may freely eat. In other words, a command to feast precedes the command to fast. And what God is really offering Adam here, as theologian Peter Lightheart has pointed out, is not just food, but he's actually offering Adam the entire creation. Meaning that God is laying before his image bearer a world suffuse with delights and riches for him to devour. A feast that will satisfy Adam's innate hunger as long as he partakes of it in communion with his creator. A context which helps us to put the purpose of Adam's fasting and the practice in general in perspective. Because in scripture, feasting is given priority over fasting. We were made ultimately, in other words, to feast, not to fast. For as we said, the first commandment to Adam is to eat, drink, and be merry, not to abstain. And the same will be true for those who stand before the bounty of the new heavens and the new earth, as it says in Revelation 22:17. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Come and feast will be the first command given in the eschaton. Therefore, in the divine meta-narrative, while fasting is an essential part of the story, because it is the bridge to feasting, it is not the whole story, for it is only the bridge, not the destination. In other words, it's not the end, but it's the means to the end. Therefore, I don't think that Adam's fast from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil was meant to be permanent. Rather, I think that in time, God would have joyfully allowed his image bearer to partake of this fruit also. It's interesting, in 1 Kings 3.9, the text where God praises Solomon concerning his request for wisdom rather than worldly riches or fame or something else. In that text, it speaks of the knowledge of good and evil as a discernment for administrating justice. In other words, this knowledge is a kind of royal insight or judicial wisdom, as Lightheart puts it. The very kind of discernment, in other words, that's required for one to serve as a vice regent over God's good creation, which was Adam's original vocation. The wisdom needed to exercise dominion over the earth, a wisdom which is the result of maturity and thus normally can only come through experience. As the Hebrew writer makes plain in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, where he says, But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice in distinguishing good from evil. As a newborn babe, naked and naive in the garden, Adam was not ready to partake of the rich fruit which would provide him the knowledge of good and evil. He needed to start with milk, we might say, so that in time he could digest such meat. Which means that the only way for Adam to fully enjoy the benefits of the feast of this knowledge was for him to keep the fast, was for him to abstain from the fruit until he and it were ready. A pattern which applies, and this is what uh, was mentioned before, of Basil of Caesarea, the principle of fasting. There's a pattern here which applies not only to this particular tree, 
nor even just to food, but to everything that God has offered Adam. Again, I quote from Peter Lightheart, who says, if Adam was going to feast on the fruit of the other trees, think about this for a minute, if he was going to feast on all these other trees that God puts before him, he would have had to dress and keep the garden, just as God had instructed him. If he was going to eventually mine the gold, the good gold, down in Havilah, in Genesis 2, 11 and 12, he would have had to trudge down there or sail down the Pishon River and start digging. The feast, in other words, is the reward for those who complete the fast for those who don't impatiently grab for the prize, but for those willing to do the work necessary in order to possess it in the proper manner or to possess it through the proper means. Meaning that there is no shortcut to feasting. And that's because there is no shortcut to maturity. There is no fast pass to wisdom. Knowledge is not just a few keystrokes away Knowledge is not just a few keystrokes away, as we are often told today. No, truth, especially divine truth, must be wrestled to the ground, you might say, before its blessing will be bestowed. It must be striven with and striven for, earned the hard way through constant toil and practice, as we read. And this is one of the reasons, by the way, the leaders of the church are described as elders in Scripture. Right? Men who have had the time to learn wisdom, which, as we said, comes through experience. So this is a law of nature which cannot be supplanted, this idea of fasting before feasting, except, of course, by divine fiat, like in Solomon's case. But I think that is quite rare. So if Adam was to partake of the full bounty of what his father was offering him, he would have to patiently labor for years, fasting until he and the fruit were ripe enough for him to eat. But of course, neither he nor Eve were willing to wait. For as it says in Genesis 3, 6, for they saw that the tree was good for food and desirable to make one wise and took of its fruit and ate. Adam's sin then is one of impatience. He wanted the entire feast of creation now. He wanted a shortcut to wisdom and blessing, which was exactly what the serpent offered him. Wisdom, honor, and glory on the cheap. A promise to become like God with a single bite. A promise whose luster vanished at the first taste. In contrast to this, Jesus, as the last Adam, kept the fast and thus was given the full bounty of the Father's provision. For he is the one who resisted the devil's temptation to satiate his hunger by taking the shortcut, by turning stones to bread, as well as the shortcut to obtaining worldwide acclaim by manipulating the Father's faithfulness. Throw yourself down, Satan said, from the high point of the temple, and it will essentially force the sending of angels to rescue him, creating a great spectacle for all to wonder at. Who is this man whom the angels rescued? And Jesus also resisted the shortcut to gaining victory over sin by avoiding paying its cause. Satan said, bow down to me and I will give to you all the kingdoms of the earth. But of course, such exaltation would be apart from humiliation, which is another uh, inviolable principle in Scripture, that if one is going to be exalted, he has to first be humbled or humiliated. So again and again, Jesus was tempted to break the fast, to take the shortcut to kingship, but he never did. Instead, he patiently endured and labored, learning obedience, as Scripture says, through what he suffered. And by being made perfect, he came, in other words, to maturity and was given then all the glory and honor and dominion. And by resisting temptation in this way, he sets the pattern for true fasting. So at the deepest level, it's not just a periodic liturgical practice we might engage in, but a Lenten way of life, as one writer put it. So again, the problem of our age, and with the many Christians who are caught up in it, is that we just want to jump right to the feasting. 
And our lack of liturgical fasting is a sign of that impatience, of our desire to skip right to the reward, to purchase wisdom and power and dominion on the cheap, when such feasting has to be earned through fasting. Let me give one illustration of the point that I'm making. New and young Christians today, I've noticed, tend to develop these grand visions of how God is going to use them in the kingdom. And when things don't seem to be headed in the right direction or progressing as they should, they tend to become impatient and deflated by that. They exhibit a restless naivete, which reminds us of Adam, which inclines them to reserve themselves for the big ministry opportunities, right? to hold out for the grander tasks, while missing all of the more modest occasions, which are meant to prepare them for the greater responsibility. In other words, they neglect Jesus' teaching that one must first prove himself faithful in the small things before God will grant him greater duties. And that principle, by the way, the principle of the lesser to the greater, they are scales, right? If you, know, if you want to lead God's people as Abraham did, if you want that amount of responsibility, well, then you're going to have to pass a Mount Moriah level of testing in order to prove your worthiness. In other words, the young in faith tend to forget, and this is, probably, this is likely true of all of us, but it's more obvious than the young of faith because they're, I guess, maybe more optimistic, right? They, they still have higher aspirations. But the young in faith forget the long and trying periods of maturation which form the great biblical figures of Scripture, like Moses and David and Paul and the rest. What we might call a perfecting delay which is an act of kindness on God's part, right? I mean, count God's slackness in fulfilling your ministry dreams as a blessing, in other words, because you can't jump from the mailroom to the front office without catastrophe being the result. And that catastrophe, by the way, won't just be you know, experienced by your fellow laborers and the institutions that they serve, which others have built, but also it will come upon yourself. Right? If you try to lunge at a larger responsibility than you are ready for, then uh, the consequences for you, and I've seen this firsthand too many times, the consequences for you will be dire. Right? It can really hinder your spiritual development. It can even corrupt you. I've seen people be corrupted by it. And so if you feel this desire to lunge, here's an opportunity, and it's way beyond what you know, my level of wisdom and ability and maturity to handle it, but this opportunity is being handed to me, even if it's handed to you by a Christian. It says, please come and do this, but you know you're not ready for it. You can be pretty sure that it's the devil who's tempting you with a shortcut in that case. Because God's plan is totally different than that. God's plan is for a long and slow maturation process, a process or project. Because there is no shortcut to wisdom. There's no other way to get there. And so what you have to do is become content in the small things, not despise the season of fasting, because in time it's what will lead you to true feasting. But of course all of that requires great patience, and we live in a time, as we said, that's devoid of patience. It's a time of instant gratification. So we don't want to wait, and we end up then eating unripened fruit which always ends the same. It ends in bitter disappointment and then desolation, just as it did in the garden. And so that's the pattern that's laid out in Scripture that, that Basil is speaking about, what we might call the principle of fasting as opposed to the, to the observed practice of it. Fasting in principle is the bridge to feasting. We fast in order to feast. And it's a principle which cannot be circumvented, as I said, to skip to the feast leads only to frustration. So now that we've laid that spiritual reality of, of fasting down, fasting is a way of life, you might say, we can now begin to speak about the ritual, which is its sign, is the sign to that deeper spiritual principle. So we're talking about now the spiritual discipline of abstaining from food on a regular basis, which of course brings us to our text. 
In Matthew 9, the disciples of John the Baptist come to Jesus and inquire as to why his disciples are no longer fasting. And the Messiah answers them with a vivid metaphor. He says, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? This evocative imagery of God as the husband of his people is an important one in scripture. We find it in numerous places in both the Old and New Testament. One of the most vivid places that we find it in the Old Testament is in Isaiah 62, which let me read to you a few verses, four and five from that. It says, you shall no more be termed forsaken. God speaking to his people Israel here. And your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called my delight is in her and your land married and the Lord delights in you and the land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall God rejoice over you. Such imagery reveals God's strong desire for union with his people, a union of such intimacy that he describes it as a marital bond. And now, with the coming of the Messiah, Jesus is saying, the bridegroom has arrived. And it's time for the marriage ceremony to begin. And thus, it's not a time of fasting. It is now time, a time of feasting. For all of the years of faithful abstinence, we might say, on the part of the Jews, the work of preparation for the coming of the Messiah, the wandering in the wilderness, the building and rebuilding of the temple and of the city and all of those things has led up to this moment. After a thousand years of working and hoping and longing, the bridegroom has finally arrived. In the fullness of time he has come, and his bride is ready to receive him. And thus the lack of fasting on the part of the disciples is a witness to the presence of God in their midst. And thus the ritual of fasting, then, the ritual we're talking about now, in part is to demonstrate one's longing for Christ and the coming of his kingdom. And since the Messiah is in their presence in this scene that we read about it, in Matthew, the disciples are no longer fasting. But then Jesus says something very important, which applies to us. He says, then the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. So the bridegroom will soon depart on a journey, says Jesus, to go and prepare a place for himself and his bride, a mansion within the city gates of the new Jerusalem. And while he is away, then his bride will fast, serving as an outward sign, you might say, of her inward yearning for the return of her groom. And this, of course, is the age in which we find ourselves, for the groom has yet to return. And so we fast today to demonstrate our longing for Christ and his coming kingdom. This time, for the, that kingdom to come in its fullness, not just in part as it's already done. A longing to partake of the full feast of which we have only had a taste. And thus the ritual fasting, notice, is deeply associated with the hunger for God's presence. As our body aches for food and thirsts for drink, so our hearts are to long for our creator and the fullness of his blessing just as the bride yearns to be reunited with her groom and to dwell in the house that he has prepared for her forever. And I think that John Piper has something very insightful to say, speaking about the ritual of fasting. He, he thinks of it as a bodily intensification of the prayer Maranatha, which we find in scripture, which is Aramaic for the idea of come, Lord, Maranatha. He says, this is, it, what fasting is, is a way to intensify that prayer with your body. Fasting in prayer, according to Piper, is a physical exclamation point at the end of the sentence, we hunger for you to come in power, O God. It is a cry with your body saying, I hunger for you, Lord, this much I thirst for you. So fasting is a way of intensifying our longing for the kingdom and for our king to return, to more deeply express and feel our desire for God's renewing presence. It's a way to bring our body, in other words, into worship. 
And this is, once again, the power of these participatory metaphors, these rituals, these picturing practices. Our hunger for food is analogous to our hunger for God. And thus, if we intensify the former, then we can intensify the latter. Therefore, these are practices which can direct our hearts toward the future fullness of God's blessing through our body so that we can feel that hunger in our body. Which means, by the way, we shouldn't just be fasting. Right? If all you do is fast and never feast, right? if you are just super frugal, you are so careful with everything you eat and you just you eat very little, right? you're in a sort of a perpetual state of fast in everything that you do. Right? You have a life that's very austere. You're missing part of the narrative in the way you are living. We shouldn't just be fasting, but we should be taking time to break that fast with feasting and celebration in order to complete that narrative where the cup overflows, right? And there's this gigantic meal, more food than you could ever eat at the banquet. And that gives us then a foretaste of the glory to come. This is not fasting for fasting's sake. Fasting is not the end. It's merely the bridge to the end, which is the feast. We must be living our life in that story, repeating it time and again of fasting, leading then to legitimate feasting. Also that we might be buffered against the impatience and foolish settling for the blandness of unripened fruit, which the evil one tempts us with. So the ritual helps to set our appetite for the full-flavored feast of the coming kingdom. It kind of turns us into a food snob if you will, providing us the right apprehensions of the mind, as Chrysostom put it, all of which exhorts us to make ourselves ready for the groom's return, which is another great image that we see several times in the New Testament, where we are to adorn ourselves with, the fine, with fine linen, bright and pure, which represents our good works, but also adorning our cities and our nations whose glory and honor will be brought into the new Jerusalem, according to Revelation 21, 26. So the practice of fasting, then, we might say, by way of introduction to our study of it, fasting is a, is a kind of sacra- has a sacramental power to it, you might say. It is a means of grace by which we are able to more fully resist the sin of Adam the sin of impatience. It is an abatement of concupiscence, as Chrysostom said, which concupiscence is sort of, you could define it in one way as to say, an insufficient desire, a willingness to settle for too little. That that desire that leads you trying to grab the fruit, to grab the glory before it or yourself are ready. So it's a ritual that reminds us of the inviolable principle that feasting only comes through fasting. That if we wish to partake of the full bounty that the Father is offering us, then we must fast until we and the fruit of salvation are ripe enough for us to eat. If you try to grab at salvation now, right, through some other means, I mean, that's another way of defining what a Satan it does, how he tempts you. He lays out all these different ways, all these false gospels towards salvation. And you can start to get impatient, and so you grab for one of those false views. It will turn to ash in your hand. Right? We shouldn't be so easily uh, pleased. We shouldn't be so easily convinced and give up such a great salvation, neglecting it for something so small, something so paltry. All of this is a preparation so that when the groom returns, right, he will find his bride and his nations adorned for this feast that we will have in the new heavens and the new earth. And so this set of lessons, of course, is to help lead us into these. I had called them fellowship meals. Now I want to call them fellowship feasts. Right? I'm going to have to change it on Slack. From now I'm moving forward. But these fellowship feasts, these are to be feasts that we have. And as I encourage you before, before, in preparation for it, we should be fasting. We should be acting out 
this narrative of fasting leading up to feasting, and it will intensify our longing for this coming Feast of the Lamb where we all recline at the Lord's table and enjoy His presence and His food. It's a returning back in a way, but even more abundantly to the time of Adam in which he lays out before him this whole world as a banquet for him to partake of.